Hello everyone, nice meeting you all and welcome to Medical Parasitology. And this is our first topic in Medical Parasitology, which is the introduction to parasitology. As future clinicians and scientists in the future, you will definitely encounter a lot of parasitic infections. And especially here in the tropical region wherein we live, parasitic diseases are quite prevalent. And also, we have several neglected tropical diseases that still exist nowadays that, uh, that still persist in terms of their prevalence. It still persists. And in terms of parasite burden, it remains a problem in terms of our healthcare. So, before we delve into the specifics of each parasite, you should have first a basic knowledge and understanding of the principles that would govern almost all parasitic infections and parasitic diseases and especially the important terminologies in which you have to know and understand by heart. Now, the references from for this lecture are lifted from the following uh, textbooks and journal articles. So remember that I also I lift references from various materials. I do not dwell on one specific textbook, but it is a must that you should read Medical Parasitology in the Philippines by Belisario, which is very essential for you. You need to read this book from cover to cover because this book is also used in when you go into medical school. I also lifted uh, this lecture from chapter 1 of Clinical Parasitology, A Practical Approach and Essentials of Medical Parasitology by Sastri. And this article, Introduction to Tropical Medicine by Rupali, which, is, which was published last 2019. Now, as a field of study, we have to understand the definition of parasitology. Parasite, uh, parasitology is the area of biology concerned with the phenomenon of dependence of one living organism on the uh, on another when you say parasite it basically tells you that a certain organism would depend the survival of that organism would depend on to another organism but that organism in which the organism depends to would have a detrimental effect now, medical parasitology is a focused or is a specialized field of parasitology that is concerned primarily with the parasites of humans and their clinical significance as well as their importance in human communities. Now, in medical parasitology, our focus here are parasites of medical, uh, of, of medical and clinical of Im medical and clinical importance. Now, tropical medicine is somewhat related to medical parasitology because a lot of tropical diseases are parasitic diseases. Now, tropical medicine is a branch of medicine that deals with tropical diseases and other special medical problems of tropical regions. A tropical disease is an illness which is indigenous to or endemic in a tropical area by, but may also occur in sporadic or epidemic populations in areas that are not tropical. When you say endemic, it the it refers to a disease frequencies that disease frequency that would occur in a certain location for almost the entire time so for example here in the philippines we are a dengue endemic area which means that all year round we have dengue infection when we say sporadic these sporadic diseases these are diseases that would occur only in a certain period of time it would usually pop up in a certain amount of time the disease you sh the, the the disease do not occur all throughout the year so it would just pop out on a certain period of time it doesn't occur all throughout the year so that is a sporadic disease when we say epidemic disease epidemic disease these are diseases that uh that um it is the, the, the disease frequency in which that disease would be con would be 
at a level higher than that of the usual cases in that population. So for example, if we have a COVID-19 epidemic or a measles epidemic, the number or the frequency of cases is usually more than that of the usual case that we have of a certain period of time. So that is epidemic. The very important concept in parasitology are biological relationships. Now, we said in our definition of parasitology is that we deal with micro uh, with we deal with we, we deal with microorganisms and even macroorganisms that would depend on another organism. So it's actually an interplay of one species to the other. Now, very important concept about biological relationship is symbiosis. And symbiosis is the type of biological relationship in which living together of unlike organism and it may also involve protection or other advantage to one or both organisms. And we have several types of symbiosis. So symbiosis tells you what type of relationship does an organism with another organism would have. So we have different form of symbiosis that can be applied in parasitology. We have commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. Commensalism is the type of symbiosis in which one species benefit from the relationship. And the very important term here and very important clause here is that without harming or benefiting the other. For example, you have species A and species B. Now, species A depends on the, the survive, depends its survival by attaching to species B. However, species B is neither harmed or uh, neither harmed nor benefited from that attachment of species A. So that is commensalism. Mutualism is that we have two organisms that mutually benefit from each other. Parasite A and parasite B if they interact with each other or if they have a relationship with each other, both parties would benefit from each other. Meaning species A can contribute something to species B and species B can contribute something to species A. And parasitism is the most important type of symbiosis related to medical parasitology. In this type of symbiosis, we have one organism which is the parasite that lives in or on another organism depending on the latter for its survival and usually at the expense of the host meaning the host in which the parasite will attach to or will live in or will live on will be harmed that is the important thing in parasitism you have two interacting organism one organism benefits from attaching to living in or living on the host but species the species the second species or the host is harmed it, it is not benefited it does not benefit from the parasite but it is harmed now parasites are often described according to their habitat or mode of development okay when we say endoparasites these are parasites that lives inside the body of a host and we call that uh, we call that phenomenon in which the presence of endoparasite living inside the host that we call that as infection now an ectoparasite these are parasites that live outside the host of a, bod uh, a body of a host and that phenomenon is called infestation so a perfect example of an endoparasite is Ascaris lumbricoides or the giant round worm. The giant round worm or Ascaris lumbricoides causing ascariasis, it lives inside the host. Specifically, it lives inside our gut in our gastrointestinal tract. Now if you are if if you are carrying an endoparasite, that is what we call infection. You are infected with an endoparasite. Now, an example of an ectoparasite are your arthropods, okay, or some of your mollusks, okay. They live outside of, of, of your body. They attach to your skin, to your hair, or to your nails. 
okay, or into your mucous membranes. So that phenomenon in which an ectoparasite lives outside the body is called infestation. So for example, lice in Tagalog, it's kuto. If you are infected with kuto, the, the term infection is not appropriate. The more appropriate term for that is infestation. You are infested with an ectoparasite, which is lice. Now, parasites can be an obligate parasite. They can be facultative parasite. They can be accidental or incidental parasite. They can be temporary parasite and spurious parasite. For obligate parasite, they need a host at some stage of their life cycle to complete their development and to propagate their species. When we say obligate, they really need to have a host for their survival. For facultative parasites, they can exist in free living state, meaning they can con continue their life cycle even if without a host. They can just multiply in the environment without a host, okay? or they can be parasitic to a host when the need arises. So either way, they can survive with or without a host. They can continue their life cycle with or without a host. That is what we call facultative parasites. Now, when you say facultative, uh, to keep the term simpler, facultative means that you are adaptable to any situation, okay? Or somewhat you, you can adapt to, for example, uh, facultative an anaerobes. Facultative anaerobes, these are microorganisms that can survive in hypoxic environment or in an, in an environment full of oxygen. So that is what we call facultative. Accidental or incidental parasites, these parasites establishes itself in a host where it does not ordinarily live. So, in terms of its life cycle, it is not the usual site. That organism is not the usual host of that parasite. It just happens that that parasite have infected a host. A temporary parasite lives on the host for only a short period of time. For spurious parasites, these are free-living organisms that passes through the digestive tract without infecting the host. In terms of host, we have also the following terms. Definitive or final host, intermediate host, paratenic host, and reservoir host. For definitive or final host, the parasite, in, this, is the, it, 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 this is the host in which the parasite attains sexual maturity or this is the host in which the parasite would undergo sexual reproduction please remember that okay when i when you say definitive host it is the host in which the parasite undergoes sexual reproduction so for example in ascaris lumbricoides the definitive host is the human and when you say the definitive host is, is, is in the human it means that in the human body, inside the human body, specifically the gastrointestinal tract, it is where the parasite undergoes sexual reproduction. And what is the product of sexual reproduction? It is the production of an ova or a, or, or a fertilized ovum. An intermediate host, it is the host in which the parasite could undergo asexual reproduction or it is usually where the larval stage of the parasite is um, taken place. For paratenic host, it is, the, it, is, uh, it is where the parasite does not develop into, into further later stages. Okay? For reservoir hosts, they can harbor the parasite other than definitive, intermediate, or and paratenic host. Examples of reservoir hosts are pigs, field rats, and cats. What is the medical importance of these reservoir hosts. The medical importance of these reservoir hosts is that they are potential sources of these parasitic diseases. That is why we have to get rid of some of the infected reservoir hosts so that we can break the cycle of propagating the, the, the propagating the life cycle of the parasite. Now, another important concept in parasitology are vectors. Now, vectors are responsible for transmitting the parasite from one host to another. We have two major types of vectors. We have biologic vector 
and mechanical or phoretic vector. Now, biologic vector transmit the parasite only if the latter has completed its development within the host, example of which is the mosquito in cases of, a, of malaria. Now, malaria is caused by anopheles uh, is, is caused by uh, is caused by plasmodium falciparum and its vector is the anopheles mosquito and inside the anopheles mosquito the plasmodium falciparum or for the plasmodium species also transmit the parasite and it undergoes asexual reproduction for mechanical or phoretic vector they only transport the parasite meaning no asexual or sexual reproduction would take place inside that vector or no development of parasite would would happen in that vector or would occur in that vector examples of which are fleas and cockroaches so the the, the parasites any form of the parasite such as the egg the adult they can be found on the surface of these phoretic vectors now, please be familiar with the terms associated with parasite, ho parasite host relationships because uh, you would always encounter this. You would frequently encounter this when we go to the specific parasite, parasitic entities. Okay. So, let's have the application of terms. So, this is the usual... This is the life cycle of Ascaris lumbricoides or the giant roundworm causing ascariasis. Now, as you can see here, this is lifted from the CDC. And by the way, if you need to look out for some life cycle of parasites, it's best to check the CDC website, the DPDX website in CDC to check all the details about parasite morphology and parasite life cycle so you can see all of this information in the cdc okay so this is the usual life cycle of ascaris lumbricoides now ascaris lumbricoides causes ascariasis this is the one that you usually see in individuals if you're infected with ascaris lumbricoides the parasite has the capacity to travel to other areas in the body so they can migrate to other openings in the body such as the mouth, nose, and even the anal region. So they can travel spuriously towards those regions. Now, Ascaris lumbricoides can be obtained or can be, can be transmitted through the fecal oral route. Meaning when you say fecal oral route, you obtain it through ingestion of infected form of the parasite, such as the ovum. Okay, for Ascalis rumbricoides, you have the ingestion of embryonated eggs, and that is the infective stage of the parasite. It is the ova. Now, if we want to be more specific of the infective stage, it is the embryonated ova or the embryonated eggs. Okay? Because embryonated eggs is different from non-embryonated egg or just fertilized egg. Okay? When you say embryonated egg, the, the parasite has also have already undergone some development within the soil. Without embryonation, transmission cannot take, cannot take place. So during Ascaris lumbricoides, in order for you to be infected, you need to be con you need to consume or you need to ingest an infected material containing an embryonated ova or embryonated egg. Now, that ovum, ovum, infected ovum, the embryonated ovum, goes into your gastrointestinal tract, enters the stomach, and enters the small intestines. And in the small intestines, it is where encystation takes place. Encystation is the conversion or the hatching of is the hatching of the infected embryonated egg to form a larva now that larva would enter the intestinal wall of our small intestines and it goes into the portal circulation entering the 
the liver, entering the hepatic vein, enters the inferior vena cava, enters the heart, and enters the lung. Now, once the larva enters the lung, it goes into our terminal alveoli in our lungs, and it migrates up to our bronchioles, to our bronch, to our bronchus, and then to our trachea, and into our larynx. Once it's in our larynx, we swallow the larva. Now, once the larva is swallowed, it and it re-enters again the gastrointestinal tract, and that larva now can be converted to a adult worm. That is what. That is now the end point of the uh, the migration of that larva. It now forms an adult. It can be a male or a female. Now that male and female adult worm undergoes sexual reproduction inside the small intestines, and the product of the sexual reproduction is the formation of a fertilized egg. Okay, so therefore. Once the, the, the fertilized egg is released, uh, is, or is formed, it is excreted out of the gastrointestinal tract through the feces and enters the soil. And inside the soil, the fertilized egg will be, um, the fertilized egg will undergo development to form now the embryonated egg. Okay, now, how do we apply the terminologies? So, based on the information that I said, what is the definitive host of Ascaris lumbricoides? The answer here is man. And why is that? It is because it is in the man where the adults of Ascaris lumbricoides undergoes sexual maturity or sexual reproduction. The intermediate host for this one is none. As you can see in the life cycle, there is no involvement of another intermediate host. The diagnostic stage for this one is the ova, or the egg, or adult, and the infective stage is the ova. Okay? If you want to be specific, the infective stage of Ascaris lumbricoides is the embryonated egg. Okay? It's different from fertilized egg. It's embryonated egg. Now, another application of terminology here is the life cycle of Schistosoma japonicum or Schistosoma species causing Schistosomiasis. This is actually quite prevalent here in Mindanao. Although this is uh, considered to be a neglected tropical disease, it's, it still occurs here in the Philippines. And we have several cases of Schistosomiasis that still occur nowadays. Now, in Schistosomiasis, the life cycle is quite different. For this one, you have involvement of you have an involvement of man and snail. So we have two types of host. Now man is the definitive host because it is where it undergoes sexual maturity or the adults attain sexual maturity or un un undergo sexual reproduction. And as expected if Organisms undergo sexual reproduction, the product of which is the formation of a forward fertilized ovum or egg. Now, the intermediate host for, for Schistosoma japonicum is the snail. Okay, Then the diagnostic stage for Schistosoma is the ova and the infective stage is the cercaria, which is a type of larva. Now, we have also some several terms about exposure and infection. When you say carrier, these are uh, they harbor a particular pathogen without manifesting signs and symptoms. Exposure, it is the process of inoculating an infective agent. Infection, it connotes the establishment of the infective agents in the host. For incubation period, it is the period between infection and evidence of symptoms would occur. This is also known as clinical incubation period. A pre-patent period is the period between infection and acquisition of the parasite and evidence of demonstration of infection. This is also known as biologic incubation period. Now, what's the difference between pre-patent and incubation period? Now, in, in incubation period, it is the time wherein you have the initial infection until the evidence of symptoms would take place, such as symptoms of Abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, 
that time in which the patient is still symptom free but the parasite is already developing the parasite is already doing something inside your body that is your incubation period an incubation period is also known as clinical incubation period and when you say clinical it refers to the patient's sign and symptoms what the patient feels and what you observe in the patient that is what we mean by clinical for pre-patent period this is the period between the initial infection and the evidence of or demonstration of infection and what are these evidence or demonstration of infection these are the presence of ovum or presence of adult worms or whatever form of that parasite that can be diagnosed through laboratory means so that is biologic incubation period now auto infection results when an infected individual individual becomes his own direct source of infection now we have also several parasitic infection that would result into auto infection examples of which are uh, the enterobis vermicularis or the pinworm and also strongyloides tercoralis or also known as the threadworm super infection or hyper infection happens when the already infected individual is further infected with the same species leading to a massive infection with the parasite and this usually happens in soil transmitted helmets or STH so we have super infection of Ascaris lumbricoides together with hookworms together with Trichuris trichuria, trichuria sometimes with Enterobis vermicularis so these are super infection and the reason for this is that they, this parasite would have the same mode of transmission and potential source of infection so that's a super infection or hyper infection but what are the different sources of infections of parasites number one is contaminated soil and water contaminated food lack of sanitary toilets and the use of night soil or human excre excreta as fertilizer also consumption of undercooked or raw freshwater fish arthropods and mosquitoes dogs cats and rats infected person bedding or clothing we have several modes of transmission okay the fecal oral route or the oral transmission is the most common mode of transmission of parasite so infection is transmitted orally by ingestion of food water or vegetables contaminated with feces containing the infective stages of the parasite such as cysts of entamoeba histolytica and embryonated ova of ascaris lumbricoides Another mode of transmission is the penetration of skin and mucous membranes. Uh, these are infection that is transmitted by penetration of the larval forms. Please take note, the larval form of the parasites. Now, uh, I just want to jump right through the larval forms because I want you to understand why we have a larva, why do we have eggs, why do we have adults. Now, for helminth, helminthic parasites or worms, worm parasites, they usually or they generally exist in three major forms again for helminths or worm parasites they usually exist in three major forms they can exist as egg or ova they can exist as adult the adult worm is the one that you see that is wiggling around the one that is the typical worm that you see that is the adult worm and the larval form so the three you have the three forms now the larval form of the parasite that is the usual they are usually invasive they are the one that is usually invasive and burrows through tissues and can travel or migrate to several other areas of the body so somewhat they can metastasize okay another mode of transmission is sexual contact or sexually or sexual transmission and the most notorious of this part of, of, of parasitic infection that is transmitted through sexual means is trichomonas vaginalis and it is the most frequent parasite to be to be transmitted by sexual contact so trichomonas vaginalis causes trichomoniasis or trich infection or uh, vagina uh, yes a trichomonas vagina vaginalis but some of the some parasites can be also transmitted sexually you have the entamoeba histolytica charge lambia and enterobius vermiculalis vermicularis they can rarely be transmitted by sexual contact especially among homosexual individuals 
Bite of vectors can also be a mode of transmission. So we have many parasitic diseases that are transmitted by insect bites, such as malaria, which is transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito, filariasis, which is transmitted by the Culex mosquito, leishmaniasis, which is transmitted by sandfly, Chagas disease, by redovid bug, and African sleeping sickness by the tsetse fly. Vertical transmission is the transmission of the parasite from mother to fetus. Okay, This is through the placental transmission. Examples of parasite that undergoes vertical transmission is Toxoplasma gondii, Plasmodium falciparum, and Trypanosoma cruzi. Blood transfusion can also be a mode of transmission, especially malaria, because they are blood-borne parasites. Babesia can also be uh, transmitted through blood. Toxoplasma, Lesh Leishmania, and Trypanosoma. Auto-infection, as what I've previously said, um, few intestinal parasites may be transmitted to the same person by contaminated hand or by reverse peristalsis or internal auto-infection. This is usually observed in Cryptosporidium parvum, Tenia solium, Entorobis vermicularis, Trongyloides tarcoralis, and Hymenolepis nana. Just a brief review on the nomenclature. I am pretty sure that you know how to write by now. I'm expecting everyone should know how to properly write the uh, species name of of organism. So uh, the species is written. The species are written in italicized or underlined. Okay, an example of which is shown in your screen. The life cycle of the parasite may be direct or simple or indirect or complex. A direct or simple life cycle is that when a parasite requires only one host to complete its development. An example of this is Ascaris lumbricoides. For indirect or complex life cycle, a parasite requires two hosts. This is one definitive host and another intermediate host to complete its development. So these are examples of the life cycle of parasites. So you have to be familiar if they are direct or indirect. So for protozoans, we have the following. For helminths, we have also the following. This is also are the indirect or the complex life cycle. And please do remember the definitive host and the intermediate host of these parasites. A life cycle needs to, to establish itself for itself in, in a host for survival and st the study of life cycle of parasite is following up the pathway of its developing of its development starting by one stage ending to where the cycle repeats so this is the generic life cycle of parasites so we have the initial infection stage the develop uh, the entering stage to the host and the development within the host and how the parasite leaves the host that enters the it enters another intermediate host or it enters now the environment and it usually also shows in the in the life cycle what happens next and how it develops into an infective stage of a parasite so as what i've previously mentioned in terms of the life cycle you can check the cdc website for the individual life cycle of the parasites that we'll be covering for this semester. Now, these are the fields of medical parasitology that we will encounter for this semester. We have medical protozoology, medical helminthology, medical malacology, and medical entomology. Medical pro protozoology would deal more on this, the unicellular parasites, such as amoebas, the flagellates, um, the sarcodinians for helminthology these are the worms for malacologies these are the mollusks and medical entomologies these are the arthropods of medical importance so this ends the first topic in medical parasitology thank you